Hello, welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Murrow-Seiler and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Sarah Semler, a curator with the Living Prairie Museum, will be talking about native prairie pollinators, who they are and how to help them. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin, PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series is a monthly presentation either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in a Saskatchewan community on anything to do with native prairie conservation or species at risk, and we have a great lineup of speakers coming up. Uh, so join us on May 11th. Phil Rose from the Alberta Conservation Association will be speaking about greater sage grouse and grassland songbirds. And on June 8th, Corey Olson from the Alberta Community Bat Program will be speaking about bats. And you can register for these webinars through the PCAP website. All past presentations can be found on the PCAP YouTube channel. And this webinar will be recorded and uploaded there in the near future. I'd like to state that we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I'd like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous people in Canada today. I'd also like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our presenting sponsors, Eco-Friendly Sask, Pembina Pipelines, Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, Sask Energy, SaskTel, and Wildlife Habitat Canada, as well as our supporting sponsors, Camp Wolf Willow and Environment and Climate Change Canada. A reminder to all of our listeners out there that you'll be muted for the duration of the webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation and questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. If you are on a cell phone, you can send your question by chat to the organizer. So now a bit about today's presenter. Sarah Semler studied entomology and prairie ecology and now applies those interests to her role as curator of the Living Prairie Museum in Winnipeg, Manitoba. She is the secretary of the Entomological Society of Manitoba, a member of the Pauschik Skipperling Canadian Recovery Group and the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, Arthropods Specialist Subcommittee. She is also a member of Be Better Manitoba, a local initiative that works to provide guidance on creating pollinator-friendly habitat. So with that, I'm really excited to pass it over to Sarah. Okay, thank you very much. I am just going to start my presentation here and if anything comes up that's strange, just let me know. Uh, all right, so um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Winnipeg and we're on Treaty 1 territory, which is the homeland of the Métis Nation. And our drinking water comes from uh, Shoal Lake 41st Nation in Treaty 3. Uh, so I have a lot to talk to you today about um, pollinators, so I think we'll dive right in. I'm, I'm so pleased to see the amount of uh, enthusiasm for this topic, so I hope I can teach you something to help you create a little bit of habitat at home. Uh, so pollinating insects, let's just talk about what those are exactly. Um, pollinators are insects that transfer pollen from one flower of a species to another of the same species, and that facilitates floral reproduction, which is basically the production of viable seeds. And this is a very important service, um, both in ecosystems where uh, they you know, act as sort of the foundation of the ecosystem, keeping the plant community going, and also in agriculture, pollinators are extremely important to food production and they contribute, you know, billions of dollars worth of pollination activity annually uh, in Canada. Uh, pollinators are something sort of front of mind these days because there's been a lot of information about pollinator declines. So uh, there are a number of species that are in decline, not all of them, but some are uh, suffering, you know, the impacts of sort of human activity worse than others. And unfortunately, there's not one single cause that uh, we can focus on to try and reverse some of this. It's a variety of different factors that all contribute to their decline. So first of all, um, diseases. Uh, these are there are different pathogens out there that can cause illness in pollinators. Uh, some of those come from the managed pollinator industry, where there's some pathogen spillover, where something like a honeybee will bring their um, illnesses over to uh, wild native bumblebees. 
Um, pesticides are another big one. So you've probably heard of neonicotinoids or neonics. Uh, these are types of systemic pesticides that are taken up into the tissues of the plants that these pollinators are visiting. So it's available in the pollen and nectar and it can cause uh, some toxic effects to them when they're feeding on the plants, like issues with reproduction or navigation. Uh, these are often seed treatments, these uh, types of pesticides. So when there's a water runoff where there's been seeding, it can get into the water that the pollinators drink. And there was also, I think, a recent study on uh, how this can get into the soil and impact soil or ground nesting bees. Uh, with climate change, there's a, um, a couple of, I guess, um, impacts that come to mind for that. Uh, one of them is asynchrony. So with these different you know, weather patterns with climate change, you can have an uh, asynchrony where you don't have a matchup between the emergence of a pollinator or its flight period with its floral host. And then you also have uh, problems where there's range expansions or contractions. And some pollinators can deal with changing their range up a little bit to follow a host plant or a resource, um, but others simply cannot. So it just depends on the species of how they can respond to these kinds of shifts with climate change. And then a big one is habitat loss. So natural intact habitat is very important for pollinators because it supports the greatest diversity or community of pollinators um, because it provides kind of everything they need, right? There's pollen and nectar, shelter, places to overwinter, places to nest. And when you lose these very diverse habitats, you lose the diverse community of pollinators. And oftentimes the specialists, the ones that have very narrow niches, are the ones that you lose first in those cases. Um, so I'm going to be talking about pollinators today and mainly focusing on this group of pollinators, which are the native pollinators. Uh, so these are the group of insects that are associated with our region. They are the endemic species that have evolved here alongside the plants that have been growing in our area. Uh, so uh, with that um, partnership, they're very reliant on those species. Uh, they're part of our ecosystem. They're you know, very important for supporting the plant function and they're important to agriculture as well. There's been some studies to show that they're very effective pollinators of things like fruit trees and berries and, and even some of our, our crops out there. And there's another group of pollinators that are called managed pollinators. So these are pollinators that are basically uh, livestock. And one of the ones that is the most prominent uh, in the conversation is the uh, European honeybee. So it's a non-native species that's brought in for um, production, so for agricultural services and products. Um, but something to keep in mind with these managed pollinators is they are not necessary in natural ecosystems. All of the pollination services come from the wild native pollinators, uh, and so honeybees uh, or other managed pollinators aren't required in natural areas. And honeybees are not species at risk. So all of the classification you know, that we have to determine a species at risk, these honeybees, they don't fit that category. Um, we have to remember that they are you know, captively bred, they're produced in large numbers, they're shipped around the world, and they have some very dedicated you know, researchers working to make sure that the best practices are available, the best suppression of diseases and the best care. Uh, so they're not the ones that uh, we, you know, as homeowners really focus on when it comes to conservation. Uh, so if you are a big fan of honeybees, one of the best things that you can do is to purchase honey from, you know, local beekeepers that are experienced, that care about the health of their bees, um, and that keep uh, this form of livestock away from natural areas that may have species at risk or that may, you know, cause pressure in terms of resource competition in those natural areas. Uh, if you purchase a honeybee hive and plunk it down in your yard, it's not quite bee conservation. So I like this quote, uh, raising honeybees to save pollinators is like raising chickens to help birds. They're just kind of a little bit of a different faction in terms of the converse, conservation uh, conversation. Uh, so the bees that you really need to know are these native pollinators, and that's what we're going to get into today uh, as we go through the talk. So native pollinators, the, this is the group of four orders that are kind of the main ones in, uh, in our urban areas and in our natural habitats. And there are other things like thrips and ants will pollinate as well, but these are like the key players here. So the first one, uh, this order is Hymenoptera. These are the bees and the wasps, and you can often see them as kind of very hairy uh, types of insects visiting lots of flowers. Another group that's great at pollination are the flies. So these are in the order Diptera. And uh, this basically means two wings. So these are insects that have one pair of wings here, while our bees and wasps have four. 
Uh, Coleoptera, these are the beetles. Some of these are great, very you know, fuzzy little pollinators that visit flowers. Um, their name kind of translates out to shield wings. So you, they've got usually this hard covering over their flight wings. And the last group, this is uh, butterflies and moths in uh, that order, Lepidoptera. So their name is uh, means scaled wing. So all these beautiful little scales give these um, butterflies and moths the color patterns and that they have uh, and that make them very beautiful for us to look at, but they're also very effective pollinators. So let's start with looking at bees. What are bees exactly? Uh, well, bees, to make it very simple, are vegetarian wasps. <laughs> so way back in uh, evolutionary time, uh, when wasps were kind of flying around in the world, uh, they're of course predatory, so they're feeding on um, animal tissues, other insects as prey. Uh, but bees diverged towards a vegetarian diet where instead of hunting, they started gathering. So they're gathering up pollen and nectar to feed to their young. When we're looking at a bee to help identify it, you're looking for four wings. So there's a forewing and a high wing, hind wing, pardon me. And uh, in the middle here, there is there are tiny little hooks that actually couple the wings together so that they flap at the same time. So they don't flap independently like a dragonfly would. They're um, kind of functionally, functionally dipterous. So they're almost like having one pair of wings, but there's really four. They also typically have hairy bodies. And even if a lot of that hair isn't visible, the important feature is that those hairs are branched and that allows them to gather up you know, the most pollen that they can while they're on uh, the flowering plants. And they uh, have these elbowed antennae at the front. So they're not like little stubby things or long sort of uh, silky looking antennae. They're, they're sort of bent uh, halfway through. And bees are insects that need to carry pollen and nectar home, primarily that pollen, so that they can provision their young. So um, depending on the type of bee, you have different structures to do just that. In the group of uh, bees that includes the bumblebees and the honeybees, they have this pollen carrying structure on their leg called a corbicula, which is kind of like a little spoon shaped part of their tibia, that section of their leg. Um, and it's got some long hairs around it, which forms what's called a pollen basket. So when it's out foraging, it'll groom the pollen towards that little basket, mix it with a bit of nectar so that it's sticky and form kind of this loaf of pollen that they can bring back home, kind of like a, a packed saddlebag. Other groups of insects, like our solitary bees, uh, they have areas of, um, so carry pollen that aren't necessarily related to like a structural implement like that corbicula, but it's for a density of uh, feathery hairs in an area of their body called a scopa. So that bottom picture there, that's a, a longhorned bee in the genus Melisodes with a, a big dense floof of feathery hair that they're carrying their dry pollen on. Uh, in the upper right, that's some leaf cutter bee with the scopa on the underside of the abdomen, which is essentially the bee bum. And in the lower picture, that's the sweat bee um, with their dense long feathery hairs up on the femur of the leg. And there's also lots of hairs down on the tibia as well. Now bees, they're very diverse. And um, in Canada, we have about 900 species of just bees alone in terms of our pollinators. And I think there was a paper that came out in 2014 that showed that about 23% of the species in their prairie ecotone exist nowhere else. So we're in a very diverse type of habitat with lots of very unique bee species to the prairies. And within that, the feeding habits can range from generalist to specialist. So if you're a generalist, you're feeding on pollen and nectar from a variety of floral sources. But if you're a specialist, you can be a very picky eater and maybe only visit a certain species or a certain small group of species or, or um, family of flowers. Uh, so that can be very important in terms of their conservation. Uh, so for this part of the talk, while I start going through um, some more of the groups in more detail, I've included some book covers on the slides so that if you're curious about learning more, I would recommend checking out these books on after the talk. So if you're curious about native bees, this book Bees in Your Backyard covers all of our native and managed species that you're likely to encounter in North America. And I think it's fantastic and I recommend that you get a copy if you can. So let's start uh, talking about the different general groups of bees here. Um, we can just break up bees based on their social behavior, um, roughly into social and solitary. So social bees are bees that have a colony um, that lasts for a season 
and they have a division of labor. So there's a queen, there's workers, and then there's males. And uh, for example, honeybees, they are definitely a social species. Um, in terms of our native bees, um, bumblebees are an excellent example of native species, or pardon me, social species. So I'll talk about their life cycle here. Um, if we look at number one on the top, there is a queen. She is uh, in the process of overwintering, and they'll overwinter in a little burrow or in leaf litter. Um, they will emerge in the spring once it's warm enough, and she'll go out and she'll start foraging to gather pollen and nectar to bring home to her nest, which she typically makes in an old uh, rodent den uh, or in some kind of pre-existing crevice in the ground, typically. Uh, once she lays enough eggs on those pollen balls and um, has some daughters emerge, these are non-reproductive daughters, they're workers. So they start to go out and gather the pollen nectar to bring it home and she can stay home to raise the young and lay more eggs. As the season goes on and you get into about August, she starts producing reproductive daughters which are going to be future queens and she also produces uh, eggs that will become male bees. So the Future queens disperse, the males disperse, they mate in the environment. She dies, her worker daughters die, the males die. The only survivor is the mated queen, and she's the one that's going to overwinter and repeat this process again. So unlike honeybees um, that have the whole colony overwinter, in bumblebees, it's just that mated queen. So in this image here, uh, we can just have a look at what some of these nests look like. They're kind of messy if you compare them to something like a honeybee, which is a very orderly looking uh, honeycomb. <laughs> with bumblebees, uh, you've got these little cells um, with pollen balls um, with uh, little uh, pots for honey, or which is, well, not honey in the sense of a honeybee, but a little pouch of nectar that this uh, bumblebee has collected. And, uh, you know, they can vary in size depending on the species and location. You might have 30 bees in a colony. You may have over 100 bees in a colony. And if you want to learn more about uh, bumblebees and their identification, that book on the right is phenomenal. Uh, it's almost like a bird guide with color plates and range information. And uh, you can do a lot of identification in the field and learn a lot more about their biology from it as well. So the other group then is solitary bees. So these are bees that don't have the same kind of complex colony structure that the social bees have. And there's a little bit of a blurred line here. They're learning more about some social behavior or some primitive social behavior in these uh, solitary bees, but it's still a, a nice general classification for thinking about how they behave. So with these bees, there's um, a founder's female, and she uh, goes out in spring, gathers up her pollen and nectar, and puts it into a nest cell. And once it's as filled as she wants it to be, she will lay an egg on there and seal it up. And it's up to that larva to feed on that pollen ball and grow, develop into a pupa, and then emerge uh, in the next season as an adult to continue that process. So she's sort of like the single mother of the bee world, um, just doing the work to give them the best start they can, and then leaving it to nature for them to continue on after that. So there's a, a new book that's come out recently called The Solitary Bees that has a lot of information on this particular group that's great to read. So I thought I'd go through some of the solitary bees because these are some of the most common ones that you're going to encounter in the environment. The first one here is a small carpenter bee and believe it or not, it's the same family as the bumblebees, but this one's only you know, like less than a centimeter long. Uh, it creates little cells in, in hollow stems and in that image at the bottom, you can see some of those cells filled with pollen and uh, little larvae. Now what's kind of cool about these solitary bees is that they um, can determine uh, the, the gender of the eggs that they're laying and place them in a certain sequence. So the females are laid at the back of the nest and the males are laid towards the front of the nest so that in springtime, they're the first to emerge and they can kind of start patrolling around and be ready to go when the females kind of come out uh, of the nest as well. Um, cellophane or mast bees, they're in the family Calididae. Uh, these bees can produce a substance that's almost like a, a liner for their nest that's waterproof and has antifungal um, properties. Uh, the ones I'm showing here are called the yellow-faced bees. These again can be very tiny, um, you know, three or four millimeters in some species up to closer to a centimeter in others. Uh, they usually nest in these hollow stems, um, and you'll notice that they're not very hairy looking, they, and you don't actually see a scopa or a curvicula on these guys. Um, they carry their pollen in a crop, so they'll put it into like this little chamber, kind of like a second stomach, get back to the nest, and then regurgitate it and use it there. Leaf-cutting bees, they're in the family Megachylidae. 
they have extremely strong jaws to do the sniffing of leaves uh, to bring home to line their nest cells. Um, many nest in uh, tunnels in old wood. Also, uh, they will nest in the ground as well, depending on the species. Uh, it's fun to identify these because the number of teeth and the arrangement of the teeth can be very uh, interesting or very useful factors in identification. So, um, and you can, depending on the age of that bee, there will be more wear and tear, and sometimes it can be really tricky, uh, but it's always a neat challenge. Uh, within this group, you also have wool carter bees. They'll go out and snip the fuzzy bits off of plants to line their nests with. Um, and you also have resin bees, uh, so they will use plant resins to mix with pebbles to make these little concretions that are their nests. And uh, this picture of a resin bee, um, one of the, well, the first records in Manitoba came during some collecting that we were doing uh, out of Living Prairie Museum. So it's a, kind of a recent find for the province in the last few years. Um, solitary bees, uh, the mining bees, so the family Andrinidae, uh, these are Again, very common bees. Uh, sometimes the male andrenids are some of the first that you'll see in spring. They've got really long antennae and they're just little flying, fluffy, tiny bees. Uh, they can come in a variety of shapes and sizes. The picture on the top, that one is in the genus Perdita. Uh, it's so small that it can be fit onto the head of a large carpenter bee. So they're very, very tiny, those ones. Uh, but more often they're closer to around a centimeter or so in size. Uh, the picture on the right there, one of the ways you can tell it's an andrina is the head is quite wide and there's these little pits on the inside of the eyes that are kind of lined with some velvety hair, hairs called uh, fovea. So that's one of the features of those bees. Uh, and then the sweat bees. So they're in the family Helictidae. Uh, they got that name because they were observed to kind of land on your arm when you're working outdoors and they'll actually lick the salt from your skin. Uh, there's a lot of species in this group, uh, primarily, well, especially in the subgenus Dialectus, which are these little green metallic bees in the bottom left corner of your screen there. Um, um, they're tiny but mighty. They do a lot of pollination in natural ecosystems and agriculture as well. Some can be very brilliant and uh, beautiful metallic colors, while uh, others are sort of like a black, shiny exoskeleton with white banding. Uh, they have very interesting nesting structures under the ground. Um, they can have lots of chambers, be different depths. Uh, in some cases, it's almost like community living in a condo where you have multiple females using the same entry point, but having their own private kind of cluster of nest cells. So really diverse group and very important for pollination. And lastly, uh, this is a group that you're more unlikely to come across unless you're working in intact habitat. Um, the melitid bees, they're oil bees, and they can gather plant oils and pollen to feed their young. Uh, they're quite specialized. Uh, this picture here is one of uh, our prairie species of Macrophis bees, and they gather um, the oils from world blue strife. So that's in the genus uh, Lysimachia. And uh, unless you have that plant there, you won't have this particular type of bee in that habitat. Um, so we'll also talk about the cousins of bees, <laughs> the wasps, either social or solitary. These are also very important pollinators. And I know people think, oh, no, wasps, like they, your mind goes to your picnic being ruined by a yellow jacket. But there are all kinds of different types of wasps that are very important to uh, to nature in terms of you know pest control and pollination. So first of all, um, wasps are predatory, so they often kill the insects that we may find to be um, an irritant to us, or the caterpillars that defoliate our trees or things that damage our gardens. They're pollinators; they'll move pollen between plants, and uh, especially later in the season when their prey starts to decline, they switch over to a lot more nectar and honeydew. And uh, they're social, they have, you know, colony structure uh, with the paper wasps. I believe there was some work to show that they have um, even some form of facial recognition within their nest mates. So they're, they're pretty attuned to their little family structures. Uh, in the bottom left image, that's a native paper wasp, um, in a polistes wasp. And these are types of wasps that form uh, sort of an open paper wasp that you see in the middle image there, or a nest, I mean. Uh, so it's not that teardrop shape. That's what you get from uh, the yellow jackets and, and hornets that make those big teardrop shaped uh, paper nests and sometimes nests in the ground as well. So there's a, a recent publication again on the right about wasps and their diversity. And uh, you know, outside of social and solitary wasps, there's also parasitoid wasps and there's just thousands and thousands of species of these things they are quite amazing. 
within the wasps and bees, there's uh, some misunderstanding about stings, and I thought I would clear that up uh, in terms of bees dying after they sting. That's very much the case with honeybees. So they have um, barbed stingers that get lodged into your skin. And when that bee tries to pull away, it's really traumatic for them and, of course, pulls out a lot of the organs with it. So the honeybees are making the ultimate sacrifice, defending their homes by dying after they have stung. Uh, but our native bees and wasps don't have a barbed stinger, and they can sting multiple times, and it does not kill them at all. So this is a close-up view of a bumblebee stinger. They can retract that and poke it out again as needed. And if any of you have ever stepped on a bumblebee nest and been run down by one of the bees, you know very well that they can sting you multiple times uh, to get their point across that you have been bothering them. So typically, our native bees are very docile and, and don't care that we're around. But if you do mess with their nests and get too close, they will let you know. Okay, so leaving the bees for now, um, let's talk about flies. Uh, they are very important pollinators and, you know, in tall grass prairie where there's wet areas too, a lot of fly pollination goes on. So many flies visit flowers to feed on pollen and nectar and particularly this family of flies called Surfidae, they're very common visitors. And uh, because they spend so much time on these flowers feeding on the flowers, they have developed these color patterns that are mimics of bees and wasps. And that offers them some protection to look like something that can sting, even though they're quite harmless. So on the far left there, we have a little species called Toxomerus marginatus. It's called the marginated calligrapher. It's a little surfid, um, maybe half a centimeter in size, very common. What's cool about that particular group of surfids in that group surfinae is their larvae are um, predatory. So if you have these around, um, their larvae and that bottom image are feeding on soft-bodied insects like aphids and things, so they're great to have in the garden. Uh, in Aristalinae, this other group of surfids here, their larvae are aquatic or semi-aquatic. So like the black-shouldered Aristolus there or the marsh fly Hilophilus, um, they have these rat-tailed maggots. So at the bottom there, you can see one with that long sort of siphon sticking out from the body there. And even stranger still, there's another type of surfid over here, and some of them have very strange larval habits. Um, this one on the right, look at that bumblebee mimicry. It's just incredible. Uh, their larvae are parasites in bee nests. So there's, there's these strange flat larvae that are in the nest kind of creeping around and, and eating what the bees have collected. And yeah, it's, it's incredible life histories for some of these surfids. If you wanna learn more about them, uh, this book is phenomenal. I have it sitting on my desk in front of me. It covers 413 species of surfid and helps you identify them in the field or in the lab. So I can't recommend it enough. They're so fun to learn about. Uh, but it's not just surfids that pollinate. There are other groups of flies that you may not expect necessarily. Things like these uh, green blow flies. They're uh, in this genus, Lucilia, I believe some of the species, their larvae are parasites of frogs, but the adults will be on flowers taking pollen and nectar. For uh, tachinid flies, they, um, their larvae are parasitoids of things like caterpillars, but the adults will be on flowers. And bee flies, they're in the family Bondoliidae. Uh, some of the species have these long proboscises that are uh, great for accessing nectar in flowers, and they can be very fuzzy, cute little bee mimics themselves. Uh, there's a great book on flies in general by Stephen Marshall. Uh, it's a big hardcover book. If you're into diptera, I would definitely say grab that one to learn more about flies in general. We'll also talk about butterflies and moths. So in this group, uh, a lot of the larvae can be pretty host specific, which means when you're planning a butterfly garden or a pollinator garden, you wanna start thinking about a native host plant to make sure that they're able to complete their life cycle. Uh, now, in terms of books, a lot of the butterfly and moth books can be pretty um, habitat specific or province specific. So I would say check to see what fits your province best. Uh, but Butterflies of Canada is available for free online. If you Google it, it's on the federal website. And that Peterson guide to the moths of Northeastern North America is quite good for getting you started on moth ID. But here are just a few of the examples. I'm sure we're familiar with this caterpillar. This is a monarch caterpillar. The larvae are quite specific in that they need to feed on uh, milkweed plants. And we always rec recommend using a milkweed that's native to your area so that it leafs out and dies back in, in line with the cycles of monarch migration and reproduction. There's the adult there. 
The adults are very generalist feeders. They'll take nectar from a variety of different flowers, but they'll still target the uh, milkweeds to lay their eggs on. And if you want to attract monarchs, uh, the adults, Blazing Star is like a magnet for these. They seem to absolutely love the um, nectar of Meadow Blazing Star. This image shows uh, a type of caterpillar for Gorgon checker spot butterfly, and they specialize in feeding on prairie sunflower leaves. So these aren't like the, uh, the annual agricultural sunflowers. These are the native sunflowers that you would find in, in prairie habitat. And there's the adult there. And this caterpillar, this is a type of hornworm. Uh, it's called a, a snowberry clearwing. So uh, this beautiful little caterpillar feeds on western snowberry bushes. And the adults are these, they're these hummingbird type clearwing moths. Uh, there's different species in that group. And when they emerge from uh, their pupil casing, they lose their scales soon after. So you end up with these clear wings and they feed during the day and hover and they look like a little hummingbird or a bumblebee. And then there's beetles as well. So I'm not going to go into too much detail with beetles because I'm not much of an expert on the group and there's a lot of species, but things like uh, scarab beetles that look like bumblebees, there's longhorned beetles, there's beetles like this one, the checkered flower beetle that hang out on flowers. If you see that little halo around that beetle, that's all hair. So they can be very effective uh, movers of pollen if they're visiting flowers. Uh, there's a book on the right there, Beetles of North America, which is a good start. And if you're interested in all of these groups combined, that book on the far right, Insects, Their Natural History and Diversity by Stephen Marshall is absolutely excellent. There are so many images and so many species in that book. It's very likely that you're gonna find uh, what you're looking for in there. All right, so now that we've learned a bit about the pollinators that we have that are native to our area, we should start talking about what we can do to help them. Because I think this is something most people are getting interested in now, you know, a way to make your garden not only beautiful, but effective as habitat for these different kinds of pollinators. So uh, the first big one for keeping pollinators healthy is conserving habitat that is already intact. So if you have natural areas that, are, um, that you're able to help uh, keep intact, definitely do that. Tread carefully while you're in them, take care of them, uh, respect your natural areas and support conservation agencies that are doing that work if it's not something that you can do directly yourself. Because again, these are areas where you can support the greatest diversity of pollinators from generalist to specialist um, all through their life cycle. But if there aren't areas of intact habitat around, they've been lost or they're declining, it's great to naturalize. And uh, this is a way of creating or restoring habitat in urban areas, schools and businesses, wherever it may be. Um, so sometimes it can be as simple as creating a no mow area where there used to be good habitat there, but it's been being mowed repeatedly. You pull the mowers off, see what comes back. Uh, or you start to create habitat using species that are endemic to your area um, to provide to, to pollinators. So when we're talking about naturalizing, um, since I'm giving a talk with a prairie focus, I'm talking about plants uh, that come from prairie habitat being the most ideal. So uh, in Manitoba, we have tall grass prairie habitat in the southern part of the province, and 99% of that was lost during European settlement and conversion to agriculture. So you can imagine the huge loss in habitat that um, was, took place for all of these pollinators, making it even more important to grow the plants that used to be here. For the prairies, you know, across the prairie provinces, you're looking at about 70% loss in general, probably more uh, of, of that habitat. So creating that habitat where it has been lost is really important. So to do that, you wanna choose a diversity of native perennial species. And native perennials are great because they're adapted to our local conditions. They have the genetics that make them very hardy. They can handle local pathogens, weather patterns, that kind of thing. They provide the resources that pollinators have evolved to uh, need to have around. So the right pollen and nectar throughout the season. And once they're established, they're drought tolerant. So this is so important um, for, you know, if we think about climate change and resilience in the plant community, these plants can tolerate quite an extreme of conditions. And the huge root systems that they have are fantastic for sequestering carbon. Grasslands have greater carbon sequestering capacity than forests do in most cases. So putting these plants in draws that carbon out of the environment and keeps it locked in the soil. But going back to pollinators, um, 
again, these native perennials uh, provide the host and the resources that these insects have adapted to over thousands of years. Like we talked about the monarch example. And another example are these Melisodes bees. Um, they are quite specialized or um, favor native sunflowers. So these are things like narrow leaf sunflower and rough sunflower. And if you have them in your garden, you're very likely to attract these types of bees. They'll feed on other types of asters, but this is their strong carbon. Uh, when you're selecting those native perennials, you want to think about bloom times and diversity of planting. So in this image here on the left side of the table, there are lists of bee genera there. The arrows refer to their flight times throughout the season, and there's months at the bottom. And uh, you can see that different species are active at different points throughout the season. So that yellow bar is the uh, bloom time of canola. So if you have a planting that's made up of basically a monoculture, one type of flowering plant, you aren't able to support the entire pollinator community that's in that area. That's where diversity comes in. If you can select different plants that bloom from April to September, you're able to support more of that community in your planting. And you want to think about diversity also in terms of morphology, so the shape and color of those flowers to match the shape of the pollinator. Uh, if you're only planting things like letter A there, with like a long corolla tube with nectar way at the base, maybe yeah, that's great for butterflies and hummingbirds, but then you're kind of excluding those little surfids and tiny dialectic bees that have short tongues or proboscis and can't get at those resources as easily. So things like asters with the open flowers are great for them. So mixing things up visually and in bloom time as well really helps support a greater diversity. Um, and prairie flowers can do this for you very easily. There's a lot more native growers now that produce a greater variety of these plants. I always encourage people to select a lot of native asters because they're so great for generalist pollinators. Pretty much everything and anything will use these, uh, including um, mints are also great and uh, legumes as well. So, you know, your clovers are nitrogen fixers, so they're going to be helping out with your soil quality at the same time. So all of these are really good to include in your planting. Uh, if you're not the type that is uh, into, you know, getting down into the dirt all the time and working with these flowers, plant some trees and shrubs that are local to your area too, because they're still providing resources to pollinators at certain times of year. Uh, so things like hazelnut, things like saskatoon, blueberry, highbush cranberry, um, and even trees that you don't think of necessarily like Manitoba maple or elm still produce pollen. And even though they're like a wind pollinated tree, uh, Bees that are flying during that time won't pass up on the opportunity to get a meal. So they will still gather some of the pollen from those different types of trees and shrubs. So this is a great alternative to a wildflower garden if gardening just isn't quite your thing. Uh, so native plants do take time, but they pay off. So I don't want to give you the um, illusion that this is going to be a, a quick, easy, one season thing if you want to get this started right. It does take some work. Um, if you want to have the greatest success for your planting, you're probably looking at um, site preparation that may take you an entire season, depending on what you're planting into. You may need to be cutting out sod. You may need to be solarizing. Uh, you want something that's weed free and nice and clean to plant into. So this picture on the right, this is the first season where we planted some plugs in a pollinator garden at Living Prairie Museum. They remain very small in that first year for the most part because what they're doing is putting the effort into root production. So this next picture on the left, uh, that's near the end of the first season. You see a lot of green growth, but no flowering. And those roots are really expanding below ground so that they can survive their first winter and become uh, more drought tolerant. In that first season, you are doing some watering just to make sure they hang on. In the second season, on that picture on the right, uh, you're seeing a lot more blooming, especially these uh, faster growing ones like the blanket flower in yellow in the front. And then by the time you get to your third year is when you really hit your peak in flowering and robustness of these plants. So that's what that picture is on the left. And on the right, that planting has been going for about 10 years now, comes back every year on its own. We never water it. Uh, we do have to pull some weeds sometimes. Of course, weeds always get in, creeping thistle gets in, south thistle gets in, you just pop it out. And you have this um, very reliable source of pollen and nectar for your local pollinators that looks beautiful as well. Now, if you can't select um, a native species, if you don't have a local grower around that does this, um, there's sometimes next best things that are available at greenhouses. So you may find um, C. 
species that are native to North America, but maybe not necessarily to your province, but still kind of fill the same niche. Like for example, for us, we have Monarda uh, fistulosa, which is a bee balm in Manitoba, but we don't have this particular kind of scarlet Monarda, uh, but you can still plant it and it can still same, serve a similar purpose to bees. So in this picture here, I took it in Assiniboine Park in Winnipeg. Uh, that is a listed species of special, special concern. It's Bombus terricola happily uh, feeding on this uh, red version of a, of a bee balm, of a Monarda. Uh, another option are horticultural varieties that are derived from native species. So there may be different colors, different floral forms um, that have been selectively bred from a wild type. And you can often find these at uh, greenhouses. This example here, this is blanket flower, the genus is Gallardia. There's a whole variety that still can produce um, decent pollen and nectar, even if they're not quite exactly the native plant. Uh, and non-native annuals, um, uh, with the work that I've been doing with Bee Better Manitoba and kind of, you know, understanding more about the gardening process, uh, some of these are okay, but some of them are not. And you have to be quite careful about what you pick in terms of non-native annuals because they're not quite all created equal in terms of the pollinator. So First off, they're, you know, typically, well, a lot of them aren't as hardy. Uh, they're not going to make it through the winter, of course. They need maintenance. They have to be watered. They have to be planted every year. And all of that has its own time commitment, carbon footprint, and, you know, use of water. Uh, and they may not provide adequate resources when your pollinator visits. So you might plant a really beautiful planting with these annuals, but when the pollinator lands on the flower, it's not getting what they need. So as an example on the right, uh, those are polymous varieties of sunflowers and they were bred to be cut flowers that people don't have you know, allergic reactions and the pollinator may get some nectar for itself, but it's not able to bring anything back to its nest. So it's kind of a little bit of a wasted trip. Uh, on the Bee Bender Manitoba website, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, we have some recommendations for non-native annuals that are still pretty good. Things like zinnias, things like cosmos that are producing pollen and nectar. Um, I mean, these won't be host plants for native uh, butterflies and moths, but they can still provide something to a bee and a fly. Uh, whenever you're selecting something from a greenhouse though, uh, whether it's a native, close to native, a variety, a non-native annual, you have to be so careful about how the plant was produced. Because as I mentioned earlier, systemic pesticides can be a big contributor to pollinator decline. So uh, it's good to have a conversation with your grower because not all of this information is easy to find. Uh, the Xerxes Society has a great PDF. You can just Google this title uh, that has this table in here with the production names of the different kinds of uh, systemic pesticides that may be used and that you don't want to see on the plants that you're purchasing. Because again, even after you plant these in your garden, they could still have effect on the pollinators visiting them. So there's a guide here for nurseries. There's also a guide for um, the, the public that are purchasing the plants that has this table in there and some pretty good explanations on you know, why to avoid these particular types of pesticides. Uh, and then another important part about your planting is not just providing pollen and nectar, but also making sure that there's shelter in places to overwinter and nest in that garden, because it's great that they have something to eat, but they need to reproduce and be able to get through the winter as well. So as an example for ground nesting bees, and of those solitary bees, about 70% of them nest in the ground, they like to have areas of bare soil that they can dig into. Sandy piles are nice for some species. And you really want to avoid cultivating the soil during the growing season so that you're not collapsing those little tunnels that they've made. Uh, for stem and cavity nesters, so ones that nest in old wood like those leaf cutters or ones that are in pithy stems, you want to leave that kind of material just kind of scattered around your garden. Um, leave the stem standing. If you have to cut them back, leave a variety of height. So there's a recommendation of about 20 to 60 centimeters in variation in height there so that there's um, different uh, diameters and different lengths for different types of pollinator species. And the big one is leave your leaves. Don't clear out your garden at the end of uh, fall as tempting as it may be. Leave it a mess and embrace that mess because that mess is supporting a variety of overwintering insects that are beneficial. So the leaf litter, there's caterpillars, there's bees, there's chrysalis that attach the stems. Um, you know, there's bees in the stems. Leave that messy as long as you can into next spring uh, until the temperatures are consistently 10 to 15 degrees Celsius. And at that point, it's safer to clear it out if you need to. 
Um, if you have to do it earlier for some reason, you can leave the pile of material around the garden and maybe they'll emerge from that. But best practice is to stay as hands off as you possibly can so that they can complete their life cycle and emerge. Uh, so uh, when you're doing all of these different activities combined, your garden starts to become a little piece of habitat, a little ecosystem. You're supporting pollinators, but you're also supporting other species as well. Things like dragonflies will come through to hunt. The larvae of lacelings are fantastic pest control insects for aphid troubles. Uh, during migration, you'll have tons of birds landing in these gardens to eat the seeds to fuel up before they're traveling away. And if it's a bit of a damp, shady garden, you'll start seeing some frogs and things moving in there too. So you're supporting a variety of different types of wildlife, um, which can become really important, especially in urban areas where there's uh, not a lot of this to go around. Uh, so just as we wrap up here, I thought I would talk about Bia Bed of Manitoba briefly, and I know a lot of people watching today may not be from Manitoba, but there's still really good prairie-related information here about um, pollinators and what they need and how to get gardens started. This website has um, habitat requirements, state of plant lists, planting guides, information specific to home schools and businesses to really get you started on this journey. Uh, we've started a public garden signing program this uh, spring that's going to provide these beautiful dye bond signs to places where people can visit these gardens. And we're trying to get into the stickering and signage program with growers too to provide stickers that they can scan and learn more information about why that particular plant is pollinator friendly. So please do check this out and uh, hopefully there's some links and information in there to help you get some gardens started. Uh, from there, I think I will uh, end things off. Uh, thank you very much for hosting me here today. I hope there's a little bit of information you can take with you to help you in your conservation activities. Uh, there's contact information there if you're interested in talking to any of us at Living Prairie Museum and checking us out on social media to see what we're up to and see some of our beautiful pollinators and plants too. So thank you very much again, and I'll try to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so, so much, Sarah. That was such a fascinating presentation and so many detailed pictures about all the different types of wild bees. It's fascinating because I've always wondered what, you know, the differences <laughs> are between yeah. these different species. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, you're very welcome. We do have a number of questions here. Um, I guess there's, I, I should say, there's a lot of people typing in um, that. <laughs> thank you so much for the fantastic webinar. Um, and I, I just want to reiterate that. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I am really looking forward to leaving my leaves next year. <laughs> <laughs> this is your excuse, like, everyone. I give you permission. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I might even do like a cute little sign or something, leaving the leaves for bees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we do have um, quite a few questions. There's lots of them coming in. And there was actually some that were sent in ahead of time, which is which is pretty awesome. People are oh. already engaged. <laughs> yeah, so um, one person is wondering, how do you get local parks and recreation staff on board to create pollinator habitat? Um, or even, you know, to leave the leaves? Do you have any comments or yeah. suggestions about that? Yeah, it's something that can be um, it can be tricky because, of course, everyone kind of has their formula that they follow for for public spaces, and there's various reasons for that. Um, you know, the relationships they may have with growers, the types of aesthetics that they're going for, the functionality of it. Sometimes planters just aren't good places for a perennial plant that has a deep root system, or sometimes these parks just take a lot of uh, abuse. Um, during the winter with plowing and sanding and, and salt and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, what I would suggest is um, reaching out to these different um, branches of your park services early in the season because many times they're making their orders in, you know, January and February. So you want to start that conversation early. Um, I would also frame it in a way that, you know, shows them that if you have a space where it's suitable for perennial planting, like let's say straight into the ground, the maintenance can be less the watering can be less, you're not purchasing plants annually, so there's some cost savings there. And I like to encourage them to think about, you know, their um, ecological, I guess, um, perception that people may have of the park space. Like if you can show the public that you care about this issue and that you're putting in just a little bit of that habitat there, it can really raise the park's profile in some ways too. Uh, so those are kind of my general um, suggestions that I would make. Awesome. That's great. Thank you. Um, 
Catherine is wondering if you know of a certain cultivar that would do the job of an endemic species or how does a person know is, is the question. Um, I would uh, familiarize yourself a little bit with some of the, the Latin names <laughs> because mm -hmm. um, sometimes when you go into a greenhouse, uh, you may know what the genus is for the native plant that you would like to get something similar for. And you may see that same one listed on a tag, but it may look very different. But at least, you know, it's the, kind of the horticultural variety that's been bred from that. So, I mean, the, the blanket flower there was a good example. Black-eyed Susans, there's lots of varieties of that, lots of varieties of echinacea, um, varieties of the bee balm. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't have like an exhaustive list, but I think that starting from looking at a native plant list, like for example, on the Bee Better Manitoba website to kind of get comfortable with the ones that are native can help you branch into the ones that are closely related in a greenhouse. Mm, that's a great idea. I know um, in Saskatchewan, our Native Plant Society also has a, a Grow This Instead, and they have like a list of native plants um, that you can purchase at nurseries that look similar to to ornamental um, flowers that we would traditionally plant in a garden. So yeah, I think yeah. There's, there's a few resources out there. <laughs> yeah, that sounds excellent. Yeah, and whatever the source, um, just watch out for those pesticides. So just have a, a chat with the grower and see what they've been using. That's a really good tip. Um, Michelle is wondering, what trees do you suggest support the most pollinators? Um, I'm a, a big fan of like the flowering shrubs and trees, uh, things like blueberry, Saskatoon, cranberry, um, plum, uh, some of the apple trees that will just be buzzing in springtime. Um, but uh, anything also that forms like a catkin, so willows are good for early emerging bees. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think of anything more specific. Those are kind of my, my go-to. If it produces a flower or produces a big fuzzy catkin with lots of pollen on it, those are really good options to choose. Okay, good to know. That's awesome. Uh, we actually have a couple questions about the the leave the leaves. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um, uh, one uh, one comment here is um, there's a flower farmer and we need to sometimes clean up areas to replant well before May long. Um, and this person always feels guilty about this, so they try to remove the dead stuff and just move it aside and leave it in loose piles. Um, mm -hmm. And that way, whatever whatever's in there can finish their life cycle. Is is that an okay practice? Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a great alternative and I commend you for trying to find an alternative because I know like I wouldn't like don't feel guilty. I know that operations have certain restrictions that they have to work within and sometimes if you're going to be able to provide people with the plants that they need to create habitat, you may have to <laughs> do some of these things to maintain your landscape. Um, but yeah, like I, I think moving it aside is a good option if the alternative is just to plow everything in. And as an alternative as well, you may want to create some refugia uh, around the cultivated area. So some growers are producing um, pollinator strips where they have habitat that surround the plot that's just native species of wildflower that they don't cultivate. And that can be a place where they overwinter or get resources in when you've removed the plant material there. So that could be an option as well. Okay, awesome. And another person has written in about bagging up the leaves and leaving the bags open um, so that way the insects can get out. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, you know, I'm not sure whether that works or, or not. Um, it's probably better than just going straight to the landfill. Um, but I think, you know, with, with the leaves being close to the ground and getting that snow cover, that's how you get a lot of the insulation to keep them from getting desiccated or from freezing outright. So I think they're usually going to be a little better off just being straight on the ground. Um, okay. But again, it's one of those give and take kind of things. Like it's whatever you can kind of manage that has the most positive impact. Okay. Okay. That is good to know. Thanks for those answers. Um, we have um, a listener named Heather who um, is wondering if you have an identification app for bees and wasps that you might recommend. Ooh, an identification app. Um, uh, I, I would say, I don't know if, uh, oh, what's that app called? You know, I may have to look it up. There's one that was produced out of, I think it was the University of Florida that may not have good coverage from here, but that was a start. Um, an, an exact app, I'm not sure. There's a, a one called uh, iNaturalist, which may not help you identify it immediately, 
but if you do post the photo, there's people on there that review and can help you, uh, can help provide a, a, an identification to you in a few days. Uh, another great website for insect ID is called bugguide.net, uh, and they have lots of images. Um, you can kind of click on some general body forms that look similar to what you're looking for, and it can take you down the rabbit hole of all kinds of different possibilities. <laughs> And then, of course, there's sometimes websites that are specific to different um, insect groups, like uh, there's one called Moth Photographers Group, which has amazing, um, you know, kind of reviewed images of specific moth species, of which there are, you know, hundreds. Um, so I wish I had a more uh, specific answer to that. I'm kind of still more of a field guide type. I love just being able to quickly flip through my bumblebee field guide and find yeah. my species there. So, and, and when um, you don't have cell phone service or reception, that's a great option. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But I mean, I would say get an iNaturalist account and start posting things because it's uh, once they've been reviewed by a couple of people, they become research grade, which means that people like me could use them to find out about range information for certain bees, etc. Awesome. Yeah, I use iNaturalist all the time. I'm a huge fan. I snap a picture of something I don't know and, and it gives me suggestions and sometimes I have to kind of filter through. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have tried the, I think it was called Bumblebee Watch, but again, oh, there yeah. are some, yeah, the coverage with, um, you know, there's issues with coverage for Saskatchewan and it's only for bumblebees. And there's, as, as you described in your presentation, so much more to, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to wild pollinators. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so we have um, a few questions kind of, I guess, about educating the public. One is, do you have any recommendations for um, or sources for signage regarding uh, leaving the leaves and stems um, just to be able to educate neighbors? Mm -hmm. um, I believe that the David Suzuki Foundation has some options. Um, Xerxes as well has some pollinator signage. Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't think I've seen anybody with it necessarily in Manitoba, but I think I've seen them in pictures in other points in Canada. Um, you could check, uh, what's another one to check? B City Canada, could check with them to see if there's anything there. Um, and in, you know, if there isn't anything official that you have an easy access to, um, you could always just make something and laminate it. Uh, it goes a long way to just have something that says this is this garden contains native plants that are great for pollinators and uh, we leave it messy so they can overwinter and then people will read that and go oh okay that's what's going on here <laughs> um, so yeah short of something official I would say just make something yourself and put it on a stake out there and it helps a lot that's that's a great idea. I've, I'm taking some detailed notes here. So you said the uh, David Suzuki Society, um, the oh sorry, David Suzuki, um, Xerces Society, and that's X E R E, or sorry, C E S, yeah. and then um, B City Canada. Yeah, yeah. There's um a program for B City Canada to make your city a B city, and I think that there is signage associated with that. And sometimes local organizations have naturescaping programs. Um, for us here in Manitoba, Fort White Alive had a naturescaping program going on that had some signage, and it's possible that there's some local conservation organizations with something similar too. Cool, awesome. I know I'm. I want to get one that says "Be my guest." <laughs> that keep it simple, <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice and big. People can see it from a distance. <laughs> Yeah, great. Okay. Um, there's somebody else who's wondering about um, recommendations for starting collected seed from wildflowers. Scarification, stratification, do you have any suggestions about that? Oh, yeah. Um, there. Okay, so there's a really good website for this um, that's uh, called Prairie Moon Nursery, and they have a section that is called pra Creating a Prairie from Seed that has a lot of really good seed starting information, site prep information, um, at Living Prairie Museum, we also have um, a Growing Native Plants from Seed uh, booklet that we provide people when we plant. Uh, so, okay, let's start with collection. Um, if you're going to be collecting wild seed, uh, be very aware of how much you are taking and how much other people may be taking because it can be stripped away very quickly, especially if it's a high use area. So I would say take a pinch, but leave the majority of that flower seed behind. Uh, and just kind of take a bit from plants spread out over the landscape. And um, I think local, I guess, botanical groups may have recommendations based on the kinds of habitat that you have and the plants that you're collecting from. 
Uh, a big important part is once you've collected that seed needs to be dry, so don't store it when it's uh, damp. You can go moldy very quickly. Um, paper bag is best. Uh, a lot of prairie seed requires stratification, which is basically um, putting it in the fridge with a damp medium. It can be a damp soil, it can be a damp paper towel, just enough that it won't go moldy, but just get them kind of moist. And sometimes they're in the fridge for two weeks to four weeks, and that uh, acts as a false winter before you sow them, so it primes them for germination. Another option is just straight up winter seeding so that they get a natural winter to germinate properly in spring. And then for things, yeah, like legumes that have a very hard seed coat, they do need to be scarified. You can put them between a couple of sheets of sandpaper, give them a bit of a roughing up, and then do you know stratification if they need, and then do the sowing there. So all of those things combined. Um, really helps improve your chances. Uh, there's a book called Cultivating Your Roots that has a lot of that information. But again, the, uh, the Prairie Moon website is a great resource for that. Okay, that's awesome. Um, I made the mistake of not doing that and I did not have any success. And um, I've, <laughs> since, uh, <laughs> I've since done a, a dry um, stratification method and um, I've got uh, my native seeds um, kind of germinating inside right now and, and they're, you know, an inch big. So I'm pretty excited with the success so far. <laughs> oh, good, yeah. good. Yeah, so yeah, anybody... Um doing that is it's definitely worth looking into more information about it that's for sure <laughs> yeah it is and I mean uh, something I forgot to mention is that there's you know parks bylaws and different protected areas have bylaws so it, there it may be that removing plant material is not actually permitted from some areas so you do want to do your research to make sure you're collecting from the area that you're allowed to collect from Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a, a great, a great suggestion. Um, last question. I know we're really tight on time here. Um, one listener is wondering if there's information about the specific relationships between pollinators and native wildflowers. Oh, um, there's a lot of specific information in the literature uh, related to research that's been done with plant pollinator networks. Um, okay. And uh, there's a really good book that uh, ooh, it's from Pollinator Partnership, uh, I believe, published in the U.S. Um, if you go to their website, it's a book that's specifically about the link up between plants and pollinators, so what to grow for what pollinator. And I cannot think of the title of it right now. So short of doing literature searches on the topic of plant pollinator networks and, and, and those relationships, uh, that book from Pollinator Partnership is quite good. Okay, that's awesome. That's a great resource. Um, so I think that's all the time that we have today. Um, but I just want to thank you so, so much for the fascinating, fascinating presentation and just um, all of the resources that you've recommended um, for the listeners. And um, I've like, I've literally been taking so many notes for your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really excited for spring. <laughs> so, good, good. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Um, to all of our listeners, thank you so much for catching our presentation today. Um, unfortunately, we didn't make it through all of our, our questions, um, but Sarah's contact information is there too. You can also follow the Living Prairie Museum and the social media um, information is just online there now. Um, and I do want to recommend you check out some of those resources that she's recommended. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Great. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, you too. Bye. Bye.